All right. I, I think we're all here. Um, we're live on Facebook. Uh, it's Michael Wong and uh, Dr. Nicholas DePampa with us. Um, if, if you have a pet with seizures, paralysis, IVDD, vestibular disease, encephalitis, that's what we're here to answer. So um, please go ahead and put your questions in the comments. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, email your questions to Q&A at S-E-V, like Southeast Veterinary Neurology, N-E-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com, uh, and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, I've got a, a couple requests. Um, in general, it's just much better if we're able to take a look at your pet in person. So we're gonna be somewhat limited in all the answers we're gonna be able to give here. So if you're local, if you're willing to travel, um, it's just much better for us to see you in person. If you have a neurologist uh, local to you, that's always going to be better than um, asking us just because we're not going to be able to examine uh, your pet. So um, in general, it's just gonna be much better to do it that way, but we'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, if you do want your pet seen by us, please call one of our offices. But if you have a question for one of these uh, Q and A's, again, put it in the comments or email Q and A at sevneurology.com. Um, last little thing to, to talk about, our seven synapse conference is coming up October 4th. If you are a veterinarian, it's six hours of CE. And um, so it's going to be October 4th email us at qnda at sevneurology.com to find out more about it and to uh, have a chance to get a free registration. Um, so, Nancy? Hi. You us all right? Hi, how are you? You've got a 10-year-old dachshund named Jimmy? He's actually a Boston Terrier mix. Oh, okay. I brought a visual here for you guys. That's super cute. So he's, yeah, he's 10 years old. He's half Boston Terrier, half Cavalier. Um, and he first had his episode with IVDD about 18 months ago. So he was yelping in pain, walking funny, saw the neurologist. We did an MRI and they presented the options of either conservative treatment or, you know, to go the surgical route. And at that point, it, you know, everything kind of happened really fast and I didn't have enough information about the operation and everything. So I did the conservative route, but we did the conservative route with therapy. So he goes to physical therapy and does like laser and ACU a couple times a week. And he'd been sustaining pretty well. Like he really hadn't had any episodes until about three or four weeks ago, he started with the yelping again. And it is nowhere near as bad as the first initial episode, but it is definitely abnormal. He would yelp when he would like reposition himself or when I'd pick him up. So I started um, keeping him on like a pen rest the last couple of weeks. And we did go see our neurologist again. And he, uh, he said he tried to like manipulate him to get like a pain response and he didn't find anything. And so I'm kind of, I, I mean, I know something's wrong with him. You know, I know he didn't, he didn't have those responses when he saw the vet, but there's definitely something wrong with him. And so my question is like, at what point is the right time to go into the surgery? Because I don't want to wake up one day and he's like dragging his back legs, you know, all these horror stories I hear, but I also don't want to put him under any undue stress if it's too soon. So like, how do you find that perfect time where he should get the operation before he loses any mobility? Yeah, so, so great, great question. And it's helpful that obviously he's had an MRI. So we know that, you know, the, the cause is indeed intervertebral disc disease, at least for the episode eight, 18 months ago. Um, I think the decision as far as intervention is, is sort of, there's a number of different factors. There's not only sort of one thing that, that we or you should use to make that decision. I think in part, it is certainly the severity of, of symptoms. So how severely affected you know, are we? Um, the severity of the MRI changes. So is it a highly compressive disc versus is it just a series of, of very mild sort of bulging type discs? Um, and then the frequency of the episodes. So you know, that it's becoming recurrent is obviously a concern. The question is, is that a recurrence of this same, same disc versus a different disc? And is this episode of pain truly from his his back since potentially the neurologist didn't, didn't confirm back pain, uh, meaning could he be 
acting this way from something other than a disk just to you know, so, sort of be a contrarian right. a little bit. But um, the assumption is, and at least for the sake of my response, the assumption is going to be that this is a flare up of, of the same thing that he had 18 months ago, although caveat being we don't definitively know that because we don't have an MRI today to compare. Um, but ultimately, things that, that you know, we'll utilize to sort of help someone make that decision is the severity of compression on MRI. So if we have a highly compressive disc on MRI, even though two thirds of the more mildly affected patients will still get better, just, just like thankfully Jimmy did, um, up to 50% of them will have a, a recurrence where their symptoms come, come back from that same disc sort of acting up over, over time. And so um, the degree of compression obviously is, is something to utilize how severely affected he was and then what the sort of recurrence is, meaning is it something that's continually causing him a problem? And, it's good that we had an 18 month run, you know, that, that, you know, it's nice that this recurrence wasn't, you know, a month or so later. I think that certainly, if that interval was closer together, let's say he got better for a couple of weeks and then got worse again, I would say it's relatively, you know, clear cut, assuming his MRI, you know, is, 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 is fitting, that you would definitely want to pursue surgery. With the 18 month period and him being so mildly affected this go around that, you know, the neurologist wasn't necessarily able to sort of, it sounds like confirm back pain. Um, not unreasonable to, to you know, medically manage him and rest him. However, if he doesn't get better, or certainly if he had a, a third occurrence, I would think re-MRIing him to compare to the previous, and then trying to make decisions from there would be very reasonable. Generally, if we have the opportunity to intervene before paralysis, that's, that's always preferred. But you know, as you mentioned, it's kind of a fine balance of not wanting to do surgery on, on patients that you know, maybe don't, don't need it. If they're going to get better either way, of course, we'd rather them get better without surgery. However, with, excuse me, the, the recurrence, assuming that's the, the case and that's the assumption we're making for the sake of, of this response, um, you know, I think it's fair to say if it's proving to be recurrent for him, surgery is definitely something to consider, but I think that decision would have to be sort of made after re-MRIing him because of how much time has passed. Do you think that the... I mean, something I've been thinking about is like, you know, his quality of life and how active he wants to be like right now, you know, he's kind of has to be like on lockdown and I like, you know, get scared every time he tries to jump. Is that going to change if he gets a surgery or is he still going to be like, I have to watch out for every move in fear that he's going to rupture something again? Yeah. So unfortunately, I think that surgery would not totally solve that concern for you because certainly immediately after surgery, Every neurologist is going to have a different sort of resting protocol, you know, recommendation. But at least for the first month, if not longer, after surgery, there's going to be very strict sort of, you know, modifications to lifestyle, i.e., sort of crate or playpen resting. Um, right, but right. then long term, we generally do still recommend sort of being very careful with their lifestyle, meaning keeping them as as lean as as possible. Obviously, a healthy weight, but but not overweight avoiding high impact activities, running up and down stairs, jumping on and off of furniture, things like that, that are relatively high impact for the spine. Not so much that we're worried about the, the disc that was surgically repaired. Once we get through the first few months post-op and that's overall healed, we don't generally see a lot of complications at the same disc, but the concern would be if he's had intervertebral disc disease at one site, is there a little bit of a genetic you know, or otherwise predisposition and, and is he at risk for other discs in his spine rupturing in the future. So um, although most dogs are able to get back to a, a very happy, you know, satisfactory doggy lifestyle where they're doing things that they enjoy, we do still, even with surgery, recommend long-term lifestyle sort of modifications as it relates to their body weight management, the high impact activities, things like that. So they are allowed to have fun and be dogs. You know, we don't want them living in the crate, you know, for the rest of their yeah. life or anything like that. But we do have to kind of take precautions long-term even if we've surgically repaired this disc, because the risk would be, could we have a, another in the future? Although that's not very common, maybe 15% or less on that numbers from Dotson's, you know, in his mixture, the percentage is probably lower, but um, nonetheless, there's always that risk of getting another disc in the future. So his lifestyle basically be the same as it is now almost, because we're very cautious and, uh, you know, try to prevent the jumping and like you said, the you know, the strenuous activity. Yeah, you're still going to want to take those same precautions, whether we fix the current disc or, or, or not. Obviously, but the risk pain of would be alleviated. Exactly. The flare-ups of pain, assuming that this flare-up is from the same disc that he had 18 months ago, then mm -hmm. the assumption would be that those flare-ups would stop unless he has multiple discs or gets another disc in the future, meaning 
could this episode of pain be actually a different disc than the one 18 months ago? And could one 18 months from now be, be a third disc? It'd be quite bad luck, but technically it's possible. Well, yeah, but it's, it's less common with his breed, right? It would be more likely if he was a Dutson or had a longer back. Yeah, so we certainly think that the, the classically chondrodystrophic breeds, meaning you know French bulldogs, uh, Datsuns, kind of being the poster children for this. Um, so those are, are breeds that are kind of genetically predisposed. Um, certainly Boston Terriers and Cavies both get discs. So if you mix them together, presumably a combination of the two would, would be at risk for intervertebral disc disease. My guess would be that that combination you know, would have a, a lower incidence on average than say the Datsun, which is the poster child. Um, but certainly it's a mixture of two you know, reasonably high risk breeds. So the, the risk and predisposition would, would remain. Thank you for the info. Of course. Do you have any other questions? I mean, I could take up your entire hour if you let me, so better not start. <laughs> but those are my primary questions that I had about uh, the operation and whether or not it was the right time for him to get it done. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're here for. If you've got questions, we're, we're happy to answer them. But. You know, maybe in terms, you know, I know everything's kind of generally speaking, um, but in terms of medication, you know, he's been consistently on meds for 18 months and he's been getting blood work pretty regularly to help monitor that. But is it realistic to think there would ever be a point, like if he did get the surgery, that he wouldn't need medication anymore? Which medications has he been taking and, and for what purpose? So he's been on methocarbamol, gabapentin. Um, he started back on the galaprant. Whoops, lights shut off. Um, on to galaprant. He'd been off galaprant because he'd been having some stomach issues. Um, and then trazodone. And I hate the trazodone because it just makes him like so lethargic. But I understand like to help keep him down, you know, he needs that. But with, I guess with the pain meds, the muscle relaxer and the anti-inflammatory, would those still be needed? post-surgery, like, would there be a point where he didn't have to be on medication? Sure. So when he was initially put on those 18 months ago, was there an attempt to take him off of those and his pain came back, so he got put back on them, or did we never try to withdraw them? We never tried to withdraw. We tried to go down to, like, instead of three day, three times a day for the gabapentin and methocarbamol, we went down to two, and we did that for a little bit, but now he's back up to three three on the galopran three times a day. So certainly one of the indications for surgery would be if we require chronic medications, meaning for me, if I medically manage a patient and I'm not successfully able to take them off of medications within the first couple of weeks, generally that makes me concerned enough to, to you know, suggest surgery. Obviously predicated on seeing his MRI and there may be other variables that I'm, I'm not privy to, but in a general straightforward disc that we attempt medical management, I sort of have a couple of hurdles of expectations. The first hurdle is we get better with resting and medications. Second hurdle is we stay better off of medications. And then third hurdle is we stay better at a normal lifestyle, meaning outside of the, the crate. So obviously still limiting high impact things, but where we don't have to live in a crate. Um, so if we fail any of, of those benchmarks, I'm generally having a conversation about surgery. Question is maybe we, we didn't you know, totally try to take him off of, of those. Right. If he truly needed them this whole time, then, then surgery was indicated you know, likely a, a while back. If for this more recent flare up, obviously you've added the galaprant and, and trazodone back in. Um, the galaprant is probably the one that needs to be the most sort of short-term medication. We don't use that one long-term. Certainly methocarbamol and gabapentin can be used long-term, but for me, if he requires those long-term, we should have a consideration about looking at his MRI and considering surgery. Um, I think it's fine you know, for the next couple of, of, of weeks to continue those. However, um, maybe the galopran a little less than that, but nonetheless, the others for up to a couple of weeks. And then we should be trying to step down off of them. If when we try to step down off of them, his symptoms come back, then that for me is a, a failure of medical management. And if we have other options and if he's a good candidate for those other options, we should pursue them. And generally how do you with measure surgery, his pain? Sorry. Or like how, do, how do I know? Anderson, no? So obviously on our exam, there's certain things, you know, different areas we're kind of palpating and feeling and getting a sense for. And obviously they're not going to tell us, but we're trying to read between the lines. And, you know, if you examine enough dogs, you can usually get a sense of where they're painful. But also from the owner's description, most of the time the owners 
you know, are going to even know better than us sometimes what their, their pet's comfort level is. Cause at the hospital, their, you know, adrenaline endorphins or, or things are, are sometimes right. high where they may not show us the same thing they're showing you at home, which may be what yeah. happened you know, when you took him back to his doc recently. Um, generally owners are going to be able to know, you know, based on how they're moving, how they're interacting with you, sort of their posture of their spine, typically, you know, you'll get a feel for that, but it's a combination of, of you know, the vet's interpretation and, and your at-home observations. Um, but yes, if, if you're not able to get him off of those, um, then definitely a consideration for looking into other options. Generally, after surgery for a routine disc, we're able to get them off of medications, and I don't anticipate keeping them on, on long-term medications after surgery. Okay, good to know. Anything else? Um, I think that's good for now. I appreciate the time you guys took to explain those things to me. It's pretty of helpful. Course. Great questions, and uh, I, I, I hope he does well. Um, Thank you. Us. Oh, if you've got any other questions, okay. For sure. I'll, maybe I'll have some post-operation surgery questions in a few weeks. Well, hopefully he doesn't need surgery and he gets over this bout with rest and medications just like last time, but um, keep us in the loop. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think that's a question that's going to help a lot of people because I think a lot of people are just thinking that same thing of, you know, when should I be considering surgery and, uh, you know, how do you, how do I know if my pet's not getting better? Or how do I know if my pet's in pain? Hi, Veronica. How are you? Hey, how are you guys doing? Doing well. I'm Michael Wong. This is Dr. Nick DePompa. Hello. Yeah. Hey, nice to meet you guys virtually. Yes, definitely. Uh, t tell us about Andy. Yeah. So Andy is a, um, four-year-old uh, Chihuahua Beagle mix, and uh, we got him when he was uh, just a puppy, um, right whenever, I guess, you could <laughs> adopt him, and um, he's about, I guess, um, two months old, and um, he's had seizures since we've gotten him, um, and uh, so he, and he started on phenobarbital the very beginning and uh, it seems like we've added more medications uh, and now today he's on Keppra, Fifenobarbital, Diazepam, and Gabapentin and um, you know some of those are three times a day um, and some of those are just two times a day uh, so and he hasn't had any full-blown seizure, grand mal seizures. Uh, it's been probably over a year since his last one, but he has these episodes, I call them, you know, spazzing episodes where he'll uh, walk around kind of dazed and confused. You can tell he's blind because he'll like run into the walls and uh, then his head will drop um, and he'll like drop for just a second and he'll get back up and walk around dazed and confused and he'll do that for about 20 minutes at a time. And um, usually they're about he does about once um once a week or so and a lot of times it seems that they're it's, it's triggered after like going to get the groomers or um like later on when he's laying down to go to sleep i guess it's like delayed um you know from some kind of exciting you know event that happened if he went to camp bow wow for the weekend you know picking him up you know th that night he'll have it once he's settled down and you know relaxing so i didn't know if you guys you know thought those medications were you know you know, the ones that I read a lot about seizures. Of course, I'm in the group. That's how I learned about you guys on Facebook. I do a lot of research on it. And I hear other people's dogs are on different medications. And some people talk about CBD and other <laughs> things. And, you know, I didn't know what you guys take or experience was. We've never done a neurological, neuro, neurological um, you know, consultation or MRI or anything uh, to see, you know, the root cause if there is anything else. But, um, you know, we just manage it, you know, the best we can. Perfect. Quick question. So did the, the episodes, the way you're describing them now that mm -hmm. are not quite like a generalized seizure, is that a new change or was he doing some of that even earlier on when he was having the generalized seizures? That's a new change. That's something that um, I feel like he's doing in lieu of the, se the seizures. Sure. Uh, yeah. And then when he is not having a seizure. So the days and, and, and weeks that, or maybe not weeks in this instance, but the, the days that go by that he's not having an event, do you feel like he's perfectly normal in the way that he developed his level of training, his interactions with you, kind of when he was young through through to today, you feel like he's a normal dog when he doesn't have these episodes? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of, of considerations. So definitely 
there are generalized seizures like the ones he was having previously mm -hmm. where we're unconscious, often paddling our legs, sometimes urinating and, and such. Mm -hmm. Those are easy to sort of suggest are, are, are representative of a seizure. And mm -hmm. there are lots of, of less dramatic events that certainly can represent partial seizures. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely dogs who have sort of episodes of behavior change that aren't necessarily a classic seizure, but could still represent sort of a, a less aggressive, less generalized seizure. Um, mm -hmm. So first consideration would be, you know, did his seizures with, with time and or with treatment kind of reduce in severity from generalized to these more partial events? And is this a, a manifestation of, of the same cause, whether that be epilepsy or, or something else? And we've just sort of transitioned to a different type of seizure. Certainly that's a consideration, obviously. Can't prove that these events are a seizure and we don't know what the diagnosis was initially. The assumption with the period of time it's been going on and him being normal between the events is certainly that epilepsy is you know, a consideration for him or idiopathic epilepsy. He started mm -hmm. a little bit younger maybe than average. You know, If he truly started kind of two to four months of, of age, that's mm -hmm. a little bit younger than our at least kind of textbook definition of, of what you know, age an epileptic would start having events, most of them. It's between one and four or one and five years of age. So okay. he started a little bit younger. So mm -hmm. there is some consideration for could there be congenital or other kind of young dog problems that he that he had that you know precipitated the the, the ongoing seizures as opposed to epilepsy? Um, mm -hmm. But the fact that he's very normal between the episodes might suggest you know epilepsy, um, but certainly not definitive for such. So first question is: Are these events seizures or not? The assumption would be with his history that they they probably are, but obviously we don't know that definitively. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, thankfully not generalized in that these are probably a little less sort of severe overall, you know, for him mm -hmm. from a, a sort of a quality of life and hopefully from a, a general health standpoint. But mm -hmm. the frequency is, is, is certainly greater than, than we'd prefer it. You know, obviously we'd prefer none, but realistically, you know, what mm -hmm. I consider to be well controlled is sort of one event every four to six weeks. Obviously that goal is different for, mm -hmm. for each dogs, but kind of anything more frequent than that we're considering kind of poorly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, obviously though that goal and that benchmark is, is different for every dog, but mm -hmm. um, once a week is, is certainly more frequent than, than what would be preferred. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, is that you know, as good as it's gonna get or is there something we can do differently? And certainly right. he's on a lot of medications. Um, question is, you know, sort of how have we optimized those? And of course, you know, we can't make specific recommendations, you know, mm -hmm. dosing wise or anything like that. But mm -hmm. you know, one question would be, you know, do we have, you know, phenobarbital levels to suggest that he's on on the right dose of phenobarbital? Meaning every dog mm -hmm. kind of metabolizes it a little bit differently. So keeping a close eye on his phenobarbital level, you know, would be a good thing to do. Okay. Um, the Kepper overall is is very safe, and we're a little less frequently checking Kepra levels, but the phenobarbital level definitely, you know, is mm -hmm. one that we, we like to see levels. I don't know if, if your doc's working on that or, or not, but that would be something to sort yeah. of see where we're at with that. Um, okay. All dogs that are on seizure medications or any long-term medication, but particularly phenobarbital should mm -hmm. have it monitored very, very closely and have general blood work and routine things, you know, evaluated very frequently to make sure we're using the medication both as safely, but also as effectively as possible. Meaning have we optimized the dose for, for maximal control, but without uh -huh. getting ourselves in trouble from a side effects standpoint. Uh -huh. um, the gabapentin and diazepam are a little less routinely used as long-term maintenance medications. Uh -huh. um, is that something you're giving him when he has an event or is that something he's taking daily for the gabapentin daily. and diazepam? Yeah, both of those daily. Uh -huh. okay. Do you feel like when you added those in it, it made made much of a difference as far as the control? I'll say that with the gabapentin, I don't think it really did. We added the diazepam later, um, but the diazepam, I feel like it has helped um, with um, the, the, I guess, frequency of the, the episodes. Okay. Uh, and I'll tell you, I mean, just over the last six months, being home more often and with more stuff going on outside and you know, doorbell ringing and deliveries. And I think that I feel like his, the frequency is, is the, the once a week is, is more often because it used to be like once every 10 days or so or whatever. And I almost think that just because there's so much going on and, you know, people, he, there's a door a window and you can see outside and he sees everybody outside, you know, walking around and dogs and everything that I, I feel like that, I feel like it's an anxiety thing um, because it seems like that when he, like I said, it's like a trigger for him, but that's why I think that the diazepam has helped. Um, 
you know, some, some with the anxiety, but, um, you know, that's just sort of my, I guess, perception of, of <laughs> seeing him and, and with the events and, you know, kind of predicting, oh, well, he's going to, like I can say, you know, he's probably going to spaz tonight or whatever because of what's happened, you know, yesterday and today or whatever, you know, outside. And is it predictable enough that you can, you sort of know, okay, if, if this happens, he's going to have an event where we could potentially do something prior to the event? Is it, is it that sort of? Yeah, and I'll try to, like, when I'm, when I'm taking him to, um, even, like, when he goes to Camp Bow Wow, I'll, I'll, you know, up his dose a little bit with the diazepam, and, and, you know, my vet said, it, you know, it was fine, and, and, like, if he's going to the groomers, I'll try to, you know, give him an extra diazepam, you know, before he goes, but, he still ends up having a, you know, an episode, even, I guess it's just not enough or, you know, he's just still too anxious. Do you feel like he's an anxious dog overall? Like in general, is he, is he just profoundly yeah. anxious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly the Dazpam might help with that. However, there's other things that are, are sometimes better, better used for long-term anxiety management. If we think that's one of his triggers, mm -hmm. sort of use other drugs for behavior modification, depending on sort of, you know, nuances that I wouldn't have of his overall health, but certainly there are some things that we'll sometimes use for anxiety long-term, you know, mm -hmm. overall just to improve their quality of life. But if we think it's a trigger related to the seizures, you know, twice the reason to, to manage his anxiety. A lot mm -hmm. of times for me at least, and this is certainly, you know, just kind of individual opinion, it's not usually diazepam um, mm -hmm. and gabapentin for seizures in dogs, you know, a lot of times is, is, is not generally thought to be terribly effective. Obviously every dog is different. And if you told me it worked like magic for your dog, I, I wouldn't say to, to, to wean off of it. But um, if you didn't notice much of a difference, it might be, you know, chatting with his doctors about sort of if it was introduced and there was no response, do we, mm -hmm. do we get their thoughts on, on weaning him off of that just to, to not be on four medications, you know, if, if, you know, we're reasonably sure that one didn't make, you know, too much. Yeah. And okay. whether or not sort of other behavior modification and behavior modifying drugs might be helpful for the anxiety okay. overall, maybe instead of the diazepam. Um, making sure that our phenobarbital levels are, are appropriate. Um, if they haven't mm -hmm. checked the phenobarbital level and his routine blood work to go alongside with the interpretation of that, mm -hmm. it's a reasonable thing to do. And the Kepra is the safest of all of the things that he's on. So mm -hmm. if we're not on, you know, at least a, a medium dose of Kepra, you know, do we, do we bump that up a little bit? Again, depending on nuances okay. of the exam, what dose he's on, things that I wouldn't know, but something to chat with, mm -hmm. with his docs about is do we have room on the, the Kepra? Because there's a pretty broad sort of range of safety with that one. So if mm -hmm. we were going to, you know, modify something before adding in, you know, additional medications, do we, do we make sure we've maximized in a safe way the things that he's on? And certainly bumping up the Capra is, is almost always a safe thing to do. Mm -hmm. The phenobarbital okay. will be hard to comment without knowing his, you know, phenobarbital dose and level, um, mm -hmm. which is going to be a blood sample that to check the level mm -hmm. there. And of course, his overall health has to be taken into account. Right. Um, and then sort of seeing if we optimize those a little bit further, potentially wean off of the ones that, that you didn't see as much of a response with. Mm -hmm. um, being on the purina neurocare diet is a very reasonable thing to do, sort mm -hmm. of some mixed, mixed interpretation of, of, you know, sort of, you know, how much that helps or, or, or not. Mm -hmm. I don't have a strong uh, opinion just because it, it's not likely to hurt anything. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind getting it for him, there's no reason not to do that. It's a very safe thing to consider. Okay. Um, and then overall, if anxiety is one of his triggers, what can we do to try to manage his anxiety, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit better and whether a veterinary behaviorist could be helpful, you know, with that um, versus, you know, is his primary veterinarian comfortable to adjust sort of some of both the training management aspects of how you engage with him when he's anxious, but also, you know, sort of behavior modifying medications if, if it warrants that based on the severity. Okay. <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you. I have to take a note. I'm going to talk to his vet. He did have blood work done not too long ago. Um, so she should, yeah. Yeah, just make sure that the phenobarbital level was, was part of that blood work. And then mm -hmm. you'll want to do that blood work and the phenobarbital level at a minimum of every six months. Okay. Certainly if you change the dose, you'll want to check it again two to three weeks after changing the dose. Okay. Um, but if there's no changes made and he's kind of on the same dose long term, a, a minimum of every six months. If there's, if it's trending a little bit borderline high, or if there's any changes on the regular blood work, then it may be appropriate to check it even more frequently. Um, okay. But a minimum would, would be every six months. Okay. The, the Kepra, you are giving that one three times per day, right? Yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yes, the 250 milligrams of Keppra, one and a quarter, three times a day. He's 29 pounds. So, so overall, those those would be kind of my my initial mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Papa, I, I I wrote it down because I thought uh, Veronica had brought it up, but then I don't see it in her notes here. I if if we don't talk about it now, I'm certain someone's going to ask in the comments. Um, I, I guess do you have any? Uh, I guess, what, what's your approach when people ask you about, should I be trying CBD oil um, for a dog with, with seizures? Yeah, so I, I was probably intentionally avoiding it, but um, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's a fair question and certainly one that, that we're gonna get, you know, or we do get probably, I don't know, at least on a daily basis, if mm -hmm. not multiple times per day. Um, to your comment about the Kepper dose, sorry, I was just trying to do the math. It, yeah. My guess would be that we probably do have some wiggle room, in my opinion, dose mm -hmm. dose wise. Certainly, to the discretion of of the prescriber, but it may be that you chat with them. You know, oh, well. uh -huh. it's like we're at we're at a very nice kind of conventional starting dose. Mm -hmm. Often we'll escalate that with with time. So I'm considered, you know, if checking with with them and seeing their comfort, oh, well. and usually bumping that up a little bit. Okay. Um, to the CBD oil question, in, in my opinion, we don't have enough information mm -hmm. as it relates to the efficacy or the safety. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, if we extrapolate from people, we probably think that it could be safe, but the truth is we, we don't know that for a couple of, of reasons. One, because just a lot of those studies really don't exist. The little bit we have is pretty pretty minimal with a fair bit of, of holes in, in the data. Right. Um, as it relates to efficacy, there's very limited information and truly knowing sort of if it's effective and if so, you know, even things that we know are effective are only effective at an appropriate dose. And what is that dose for this purpose mm -hmm. in dogs? And I don't think we've got that very well worked out. The other big thing that sort of, you know, worries me a little bit is the, the lack of, of sort of continuity between brands and between the label and what's actually in the bottle. So mm -hmm. because it's not actually considered a pharmaceutical and kind of fits in the nutraceutical kind of uh, realm, it flies a little bit under the radar as it relates to quality uh, sort of assurance. And, you know, if the mm -hmm. label says that there's, you know, this potency in the liquid, um, there's a mm -hmm. fair number of, of reports of actual independent lab testing suggesting that what's in the bottle is not actually what the label says, yeah. um, even with some of the very reputable sort of companies. So then we don't truly know how much we're giving and then therefore it's hard to gauge is that because it doesn't work because we're not giving the right dose or we think we're giving the right dose, but we're not actually giving the right dose. Mm -hmm. Also the potential for contaminants and things like that because they're sort of flying a little bit under the radar. You don't mm -hmm. know that there's not things in, in there that mm -hmm. we wouldn't want for a dog to have. So um, right. my hope would be that we can better answer that question in, in five years or so when there's more data. And mm -hmm. I certainly hope that it's helpful because if we could have something that's safe and helpful that would help you know many patients, you know potentially Andy and, and others. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, I'm not able to advocate for it because we mm -hmm. don't have that information and we do have those sort of challenges that still need to be worked through. I think we will over time work through those things. There's plenty of people that are, are working on it. So hopefully down the road, it becomes an option. For me currently, it's, it's not something yeah. that I'm able to recommend. Yeah, I was, I, my vet gave me the, um, pretty much the same exact <laughs> uh, comment that you did about the CBD pretty, and, and, and I've tried two different ones with Andy, um, both from people that I knew that were selling it and uh, I didn't, it didn't change anything and, and, and help anything. And so, um, and you're right, you know, who knows if he was getting the right dose, if it was, you know, too much, too little, or if it was even, you know, a, <laughs> the real deal. Uh, so I haven't, you know, given him any, um, since then. So I don't know that that's, you know, going to be the answer for, for Andy. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any other questions? No, this has been so helpful. I, it, 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 I've been watching you guys and, you know, when I put the question in last week and I got the email, I was really excited because I know I, you get so many questions and it's, that's, it's a very busy uh, group. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that the community of, <laughs> that there's a community of, you know, dog owners with so many pets that have seizures. I can't believe it. It's, you know, it's so sad and I, and I see some of the sadness from it too. So, you know, anything we can do to try to manage it or, you know, uh, and, and also, I mean, I like to hear different opinions, you know, a lot of your opinions are the same as my vets and some of them are different and it's, you know, it's good to, it's good to, um, you know, just 
you know, kind of confirm some of the things that we have been doing. And, and I've written out a lot of great questions to ask her. And, um, you know, so I'll keep you guys posted. <laughs> great. Well, very nice meeting you. Best of luck. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Have a great day. I really appreciate it. Take care. All right, bye-bye. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Great, I'm, I'm Michael Wong. This is Dr. Nick DePampa. Um, you've got a three-year-old toy fox terrier Maltese mix named Milo. Is it Milo or Milo? Milo. Milo, perfect. Uh, I guess, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on with Milo? Well, he's a very normal dog all the time, super fun. He's got two speeds, crazy running fast dog or chill. But he has these episodes after he eats where he's biting the air and licking the air and kind of like moving his head back. And I was like, well, what are we honestly, unfortunately, we haven't really thought much of it because I was just being a weird dog. And so it's been going on for at least a year. And then my son was like, We've got, what is this? This is so weird. So we started Googling and and looking and we found YouTube and I'm sure that's the last thing you want to hear, but YouTube is showing that it's got, you know, that they could be a neurological and then they were seeing some acid reflux could be an issue. They call it gulping there. They call it fly biting here. You know, it's just different things. And, and it looks about the same to us, but it only happens after he eats and um, I can distract him and get him out of it. Like while it's happening, I can say, Hey, how about coming over and get a treat or going over there and doing this? and he'll stop, but most of the time he'll go back to that behavior again for a little while. It can go on from a minute to 15 minutes, and then, and, I mean, it can, just, it can go on and on, but it's just, we can get him doing something else and he'll go back to it. But after it's over, it's totally normal. It goes right, there's no postictal situation. I don't notice any tiredness. I don't see him like being confused, wobbly, nothing. It's just back to normal Milo, and so, I don't know, our, our vet, we're, we're very lucky to have a very attentive vet, but they've been calling us and situating things, but he saw some videos of him and he thought it looked like it could be neurological seizures. So we put him on Valium twice a day, morning and night right now, while we're testing this out. And he's like, are you seeing improvement? The problem is we really didn't know it was something to really be concerned about until now. And we're noticing as we're keeping our detailed log, I'm not finding a time that's happened that it's not right after a meal like right after. I don't know. I just don't want to, um, so we're doing the, the, the volume until Saturday. And then we are thinking about doing the, um, uh, pheno after that. Um, but if it is not neurological, I definitely don't want to give him something he doesn't need. Sorry. Did you say that so far on the volume, there was no response or is it, is it still happening each time he eats? Definitely still happening when he eats. Every time he eats, it happens, no matter what. Um, the problem is, is we didn't really know it was a big deal before, so we weren't really watching it right before the Valium we started. It was just kind of, oh, weird Milo doing something. Let's, you know, do something else. And so now that he's uh, more close to seeing it happen, I'm taking videos. I think I sent one in. I sent some in. Do you guys know if you had a chance to look at those? But it's just, it's weird. I don't. I don't know because it's always after he eats, but then I looked up things and um, it was saying that I guess you can have a neurological thing happen with doing an activity change, like eating, going to sleep, waking up, those kind of things. I'm like, is this just his little weird little trigger in his brain or is it acid reflux? Because he does burp sometimes and he's, you know, I don't know. Does he have any other gastrointestinal symptoms? in terms of vomiting, diarrhea, food allergies? Definitely not diarrhea. He's totally normal there, but he, um, every once in a while will throw up. We have two little dogs. If there's throw up on the ground and it's yellow foamy, it is Milo. We know that, we know it's not the other one. When I say that that happens, it can kind of happen maybe once or twice a month, maybe not at all. Like it's not a consistent thing. He does, he's, he's kind of, we have done some free feeding, which we're gonna be changing that, because he doesn't overeat, he's been 11 and a half pounds his whole life. Like, well, since he got to that size. And we've had him since he was a puppy. He's just, he just eats when he wants and doesn't. But we've noticed he does a big eat at night. He doesn't usually piece at it. It's just a big meal at night. So I don't know if that's causing some irritability in his tummy or I don't know. And no other major medical problems. He's had kind of general health checkups, blood work, things like that. And he's otherwise healthy. Uh yeah, he's super healthy. Yeah, there's nothing that's been, um, and the doctor, when he looked at him last Wednesday, looked in his optic area and said there was no damage. I don't know what that means, but that's good, I guess, if it comes, if it was neurological. 
there's no damage happening with that, he said. Okay, good. So definitely for for atypical events like that, where there's a period where they're they're doing something funny, you know, the question is obviously, is that a partial seizure, which I think is kind of, you know, the, the thing that's worrying you the most is, is it a neurologic problem? And if so, is it kind of a, a partial seizure, meaning there's a pretty large spectrum of things that can represent seizures, you know, outside of the obvious generalized seizures where they're unconscious, which, you know, are generally pretty obvious. There are lots of types of partial seizures. And, but the other question is, could there be something non-neurologic? Could it be a non-seizure weird episode that's not actually neurologic? And certainly I think with it occurring, you know, right after he's eating, you know, and, and the fact that you can distract him, I think there's certainly some potential for it to be a non-neurologic problem. Certainly don't have enough information to definitively say it's not neurologic. I think we should consider both, but things to think about with it occurring only associated with eating or some of the other kind of easier things. So sort of for fly biting type events, and there's a bunch of different names that people give them, we kind of think about a, a number of categories, which you hit on, hit on many of them. So certainly partial seizures can look like a fly biting type event. So stays on the list. Um, mm -hmm. Primary eye problems, the so dogs that get little floaters and th their eyes and things like that can sometimes have strange events, which might also be in part why your vet was taking, taking a look at the eyes. Um, gastrointestinal is also one of the, the big ones. So there's sort of a, a relatively decently sized sort of research study out of Canada that looked at dogs with fly biting behaviors and reported a, a reasonably large percentage of them had sort of subclinical gastrointestinal hypersensitivities. So where they actually had a gastrointestinal problem, even though they didn't have classic symptoms of a gastrointestinal problem. Um, so certainly food hypersensitivities and things like that need to be on the list, even if he doesn't have classic GI symptoms. Gastroesophageal reflux, you know, certainly could be on the list as well, Doug's. We think suffer from that maybe a little less commonly than, than, than people, but certainly it's possible. And then the other one to consider in his case is, is sort of in the video, it, it looked like he was pretty tentative about how he was eating. So just making sure there's, there's nothing kind of dental wise that would sort of, is he feeling something funny after he eats, you know, whether it's little hairs, hairs going AWOL in his mouth, or does he yeah. have a, a dental issue? You know, because he seemed like, and I don't know if that's just his nature, but he was kind of pecking at the food in a pretty ginger way. Um, so is there something, you know, in his mouth that that's creating that movement, but it's more a response to something he's feeling. So partial seizures, certainly a consideration, a little lower on the list, I think, with, with these other features associated with the timing of eating and whatnot. Uh, okay. Dental disease or otherwise a physical feature associated with his mouth needs to be a consideration. Um, okay. Gastrointestinal disease, I think, needs to be pretty high on the list as well. Then ocular, I think, is lower on the list in his case just because it's only associated with eating. Okay. Presumably, if it was related to sort of floaters or whatnot, that wouldn't occur just when he's eating in most instances. So uh, kind of GI and dental would be kind of easier things to, to start ruling out. And then if you didn't find the answer, then we think about looking for neurologic problems. And right. you know, I think that the trial of an anti- sort of seizure medication is not an unreasonable thing to, to try. Um, a lot of times we'll use Capra for that, you know, sort of as opposed to, to Valium, but the, the logic is the same that, you know, if, if these events go away on an anti-epileptic medication, even though Valium is maybe not purposefully used in a long-term event, but for a short trial is, is maybe, maybe, you know, a consideration. Um, if there's no response to that, you know, it might be that it's just not actually a seizure related phenomenon although Capra would maybe be a slightly preferred choice for the average dog, but um, nonetheless, the idea of a trial is, is reasonable. Was that? Is he too small for Capra? Uh, no, so there, there's, there's no quote unquote too small for, for Capra because um, okay. it does come as a liquid. Um, oh. so with the liquid, we can titrate for any size patient. He's just oh. too small for the extended release Capra, which might be the, you know, sort of the question. So if we're using regular Keppra, meaning the liquid or the traditional tablets, it has to be given three times per day. Um, whereas the extended release can sometimes be used twice per day, but the extended release is only gonna work for medium and large size dogs because we can't fractionate those tablets. So they have to take the whole tablet and it only mm -hmm. comes in the larger sizes. Um, gotcha. through, through liquid Keppra or the, the conventional sort of regular release tablets, we could get to a dose for them. Um, but either, either way, I, I think though, the focus might be more on making sure that there's not a dental or gastrointestinal cause first. Um, and then if we, if we don't find an answer there, certainly a Keppra trial could be considered. If the episodes 
improved substantially with the Kepler trial, at least we know we're in the wheelhouse of it being neurologic. It still won't tell us the cause and other diagnostics would, would definitely be indicated if, if it's an option, um, but at least it would let us know kind of that we're in that, that wheelhouse because um, uh -huh. non-neurologic things would not be expected to respond to you know, a Kepler trial. Um, uh -huh. But focus for me first would be a really good dental exam and kind of some gastrointestinal sort of either trials or diagnostics um, first uh -huh. and then, then escalating to that if, if necessary. Gotcha. If you were to do the Kepra, what would be a dose you would think would be good for that little guy? So it, it depends on many factors of his overall health. And, and you know, obviously, because I haven't seen him, I, I, I can't give a particular dose other than to say kind of common starting doses are in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram three times per day. Very important that it's every, every eight hours, truly three times per day. That's a sort of textbook definition starting dose. I don't know if that's appropriate for, for Milo or not, obviously, without having a relationship with him and knowing his general health and things like that, obviously. The final decision there would have to come from, from his primary vet, but generally speaking, an acceptable starting dose is kind of in the 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram of body weight every eight hours. That regular release Kepra is not ever recommended to be given just twice per day. So if we're gonna do that trial, something that we need to do it at a conventional dose in a conventional frequency. Um, but again, that may not be necessary because I have a little bit of a a suspicion that there's the potential for non-neurologic causes that you know maybe haven't been fully explored just yet. Yeah, hasn't been. We haven't. We're just kind of confused. But yeah, we'll go that way. I want to look at all the the options. Thank you. I was um, a little worried about starting the pheno. Obviously, everyone's got their fears with that one. But the, if he were to start the Kepra, it's not the same as starting the pheno. Getting off of it's okay. Yeah. So if we get if we get to the point of of needing to do an anti-epileptic drug trial, um, I would chat with with this provider about the potential for Kepra over phenobarbital for couple of reasons. Phenobarbital is a very good drug. We prescribe it on a, on a very regular yeah. basis, but whenever we're using it for a trial where we're doing a sort of a test run, we want something that tends to work quickly um, with minimal side effects so that we're not introducing different variables and things that create confusion. And so the Kepra tends to sort of work a lot more quickly overall than the phenobarbital. Um, it also has a, a little bit of a more friendly kind of safety profile and a lot less side effects. So particularly if I'm not quite sure if they, if they need an anti-seizure medication and we're doing it kind of as a therapeutic trial to kind of try it, see the response to work backwards. Um, I tend to use a lot more Kepra in that instance, just because the phenobarbital is going to take up to a couple of weeks to see the full effect. Um, yeah. And there's the potential for side effects along the way. And then do we lose sight of how we're doing? If, if he's sedated, getting used to the medication, does it, does it sort of interfere with our the purity of our sort of evaluation of, of, of the trial. So Kepra would probably be the, the preferred one in that instance. Now, obviously if we prove that he has a, a seizure condition, there are definitely dogs with seizures that need phenobarbital to be well controlled. But for the sake of a therapeutic trial, I, I generally wouldn't go straight to phenobarbital. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, let me peek at everything about that. Um, okay, I'm a little nervous to give him his heart. Um, we're medicine just care they can trigger things and whatnot. Is that something I should be scared of right now? Or should I just, cause he's due, he's due for it, but I don't, I'm just nervous as things are going on or figuring things out. Do you know which, which brand he takes? Yeah, I wrote it down. Um, he is on HeartGuard. Yeah. So the, thankfully that's one of the ones that we consider to be in the spectrum of, of concern. There's concern with, with any medication we give him since we don't know what his underlying condition is, but Generally, even in dogs that have seizures, that's one of the more preferred oh. choices. Oh, um, there, is, there is undoubtedly risk, and again, I can't tell you to give it or not give it because I'm not privy to the details of his health, but um, generally for my patients that have seizures, that's gonna be kind of the go-to one for us to give. They all have some degree of theoretic risk as it relates to seizures. That one tends to be one that we, in reality, don't see a lot of, you know, sort of concerns with, but there is a risk. And certainly if you read the label, it, it will list concern for alterations of seizure threshold and things like that. Um, but compared to the other choices, that tends to be one that I personally have a little bit more comfort in. Um, oh, obviously monitor closely and, and make sure that you don't see a trend of increased events associated with, you know, the, the couple of days after you've given it or anything like that. Um, and of course, check with the prescriber to make sure they're comfortable with, with you administering it. But from my perspective, you know, as, as long as it's been prescribed to him, we know he's heartworm negative. The risk of not giving it and him developing you know, heartworms and having a whole other problem are, are probably greater than the theoretic risk. 
I'll give it to him then. Thank you. I'm, I've not been told not to. I just, I'm just nervous, <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is great. I, I think I'm, I like that you're thinking maybe it's not neurological. So hopefully <laughs> we'll see. We've got a great vet and we're seeing him on Saturday and he's actually wanted to hear everything you guys had to say. So I'm sharing this with him. And so we're, yeah, we're very much so being watched over and he's being cared for. So we'll definitely get in and we'll talk about all these options. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Alrighty. Thank you so much. Have a great Thanks. day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm just zinging them at you today, Dr. Napamba. <laughs> How do you feel about chiropractic care after a fibrocartilaginous embolism? Presumably there would be no need for it. So, you know, FCEs are not considered a structural problem. So an FCE or fibrocartilaginous embolism is sort of a embolic event where the spinal cord doesn't get sufficient blood supply. Um, so it really is more of a a, a case for physical therapy in terms of, of things to regain sort of strength, coordination, proprioception, all of those things, which generally physical therapy, not chiropractic care is, is going to be more appropriate for that. In general, there's not a lot of specific conditions in dogs where sort of chiropractic care is going to be indicated, um, but certainly intervertebral disc disease would be contraindicated and be a strong recommendation not to pursue um, for an FCE, there's probably no contraindication, but I, I can't see a mechanism of how it would help. Uh, so this is from Johnny. His cat gets seizures every day, but they don't last long. I noticed a pattern before he gets a seizure. Is it possible that some seizures are caused by a pinched artery and cause lack of oxygen to the brain, which triggers seizures? So um, obviously, we, we don't know how old uh, J Johnny's cat is, how long we've been having seizures, et cetera. But I guess specific to the question is, um, or specific to the question, is it possible that some seizures are caused by a pinched artery uh, or lack of oxygen to the brain, which triggers seizures? Sure. So technically, there are vascular causes or blood vessel related causes of seizures in, in dogs and cats. More so, not really a pinching necessarily of, of an artery, but either an occlusion or sort of a blood clot, if you will, or a hemorrhagic stroke. So essentially, Nonetheless, strokes are, are obviously a vessel-related problem that results in a reduced oxygen to supply to the brain, and certainly that can be a, a nidus for seizure activity going, going forward long-term. Generally, that would be a much less common cause of seizures, and certainly if, if Johnny's cat's having seizures every day, you know, strongly recommend to, to seek care for him in terms of, even if they're brief, if they're daily, they're probably impacting quality of life. And, care should, should be sought if it hasn't been to see if we can't get better control? Yeah, um, I, I feel like I, I commonly answer the question of, of uh, causes of seizures, or at least I go over it, um, you know, for dogs, it might be worthwhile just uh, for Johnny, just talking about in general causes of seizures in cats and, and our approach to it. Sure, so big, big picture, three categories, primary sort of first category is intracranial causes of seizures. So primary brain problems, which the list is, is somewhat dependent, or at least partially could have depended upon the, the age and, and other exam findings. But examples of intracranial or brain causes would be things like strokes, to, to Johnny's point, so vascular related problems certainly do happen. Uh, brain tumors obviously can be an intracranial cause. If we're young, we think about kind of congenital problems, meaning things we're born with or infectious diseases, um, relatively long list, but kind of primary brain problems. Um, second big category of metabolic problems, so problems outside the brain, um, so sort of organ-related dysfunctions, so um, general health type stuff if we're quite young, maybe low blood sugar, things like that. Um, if we're older, do we have cancers elsewhere in our body? Do we have high blood pressure? Are we hyperthyroid? And things like that. And then idiopathic or sort of that epileptic category technically does exist in cats. It's just a lot less common than in dogs, so in cats, sort of the assumption is there's an underlying cause until proven otherwise. However, there are definitely some cases where we look both for intracranial and extracranial causes and don't find and we put them in that sort of idiopathic epilepsy kind of category, meaning we have seizures without a specific known cause. Um, however, in cats, it's a little less, less common to have sort of a true genetic epilepsy, but we'll still keep that as the, the third sort of category. Um, so brain problems, metabolic or sort of general health problems and and epilepsy, but less common. All right. Well, let's actually go to, to Sharon. Sharon's been uh, in, in our waiting room for about an hour now, so I don't want to keep her waiting any longer. She has a seven-year-old lab named Lewis, 
uh, that looks like uh, has seizures, and uh, we'll chat about that. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you for your patience. Um, Thank you. I'm Michael Wong. This is Dr. Nicholas DePampa. Uh, t tell us about Lewis. Okay, Lewis, I'm in the UK. Lewis is a seven-year-old Labrador. He started having seizures just around the age of 12, 13 months. So he's, he's obviously had them for quite some time and we've been managing them, but he has always had one seizure a month. However, recently, the, the, I'd say over the last 12 months, they're now about five, six minutes long. Um, and they're very, they're, sort of, they're quite violent. He's shaking. Um, his jaw is wide open with his teeth showing. He's flicking his head. Um, a couple of times he might yelp during the seizure. Um, but recently he's on Libramide and Epifen twice a day. So his Epifen is on a 60 milligram and a 15 milligram and the libramide is three to five milligrams so he's having those morning and evening 12 hours apart with food um we, we've tried various combinations over what sort of six years and we've just or the vet has just changed them again the beginning of august so he now has He's upped the 15 milligram, so he's having that one twice a day, as well as the other meds. But the problem is, whenever we up them, I don't think he's got a quality of life because he's falling over. He's, he'll either fall down the stairs or he can't get up the stairs. When he's going to the toilet, he falls over. He, he's all over the place. So I've actually said to my vet, I want to reduce the dose. But my vet don't want to because of the type of seizure he's having now and the length. So my question is, it's, if the vet wants to reduce that seizure a month or the, the type of seizure versus his quality of life, I'm thinking, should he have, or is it right to let him have that one seizure a month? And I know what the risks are so that he's got a normal daily life because he loves exercise, that he loves running off the lead and we can't let him do that. So it's, I mean, I've tried CBD um, and I tried it on a very low dose. I sourced a really good quality. I done a lot of work, um, sort of read up a lot on it. So I found that what I felt was a good quality starting with a low dose, I've gradually increased it. This was over seven months and it made no difference. So, uh, you know, that didn't work for him. So I am, he's, he's on this medication now, but I want to start reducing this additional tablet that the vet had increased recently. And I just, in my head, I don't know, is it right to try and stop him having this one seizure or the, or the severity of the seizure? versus the normal daily life that I think he should have. I don't know. It's definitely a great um, a couple of questions for you. So when, when you've increased the dose like, like you have now, sort of historically, I know you've gone through a couple different combinations of, of things, mm -hmm. but when you've increased the dose and noticed these sort of you know, more severe side effects as it relates to him being able to get around and exercise, how much time have you given that to see if those features get better with time? I know most recently you just changed it in August, but have you tried this change before? And if so, for how long? Before, um, I mean, my vet, I've got a very good relationship with him. Um, and I really do admire what he does. But so firstly, when Lewis was on the Epifen, he increased the Libramide. Um, and when we increased the Libramide, I think it was about two months after we had to decrease it because he could hardly stand when the Libramide was increased. So then that was decreased and we left it. I think it was a, 
a good two to three months with blood tests in between to check his levels. Um, and then obviously the seizures continued once a month. So then he increased the epiphen. But it doesn't matter what increased or decreases, it always has that one seizure a month. So regardless of what um, you've tried regardless, over, once yeah. a month doesn't seem to have changed. Yeah. What about the severity? Are they getting more severe, the five to six minutes? Is that historic or is that recent? No, I mean, I've got to say a couple of years ago, I would say that was about four minutes. I mean, and they are quite violent. They, they you know, they're not nice to see. Um, but now his last seizure last month was about six, seven minutes. Mm -hmm. So they are getting that little bit longer. And I do understand what my vet's saying. You know, there is a high risk there. But in my head, I'm just thinking he's, his normal daily routine just can't be kept like that because of he's all over the place. And then you, you mentioned that they did some drug levels you know, before deciding to adjust sort of, do you know if he's on the higher end drug level wise? I can't, I know my vet said he's well in the therapeutic, therapeutic range. Um, he's had that many different tests done because the last time I took him, all of a sudden he was drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, and he was, he was in like a constant pattern. He would come in the back door nearly drink a whole bowl of water, walk through the house, go out the back garden, go away. And then that's how the whole circle went, which is why I originally took him back to say, is there something else going on? Um, and he'd done all these different tests because he was quite concerned, but he said they'll come back fine. But he was more concerned on the length of the seizure because this time it was seven minutes. So he upped his medication, but we're back to him falling all over the place again. And he's still drinking a lot. Yeah, and certainly most, most of what you're describing, the increased thirst, increased urination, the weakness associated with his legs, those are definitely things that are, are not uncommon side effects for, for both the phenobarbital and, and the potassium bromide, which are the equivalents of, of those here in the States. But um, most dogs will get used to them. You know, if their drug levels aren't overly high, most dogs do get used to them. And generally, we're encouraging people to kind of wait and see if, if we can't, you know, get them used to those medications. And for the, for the Libromide in particular, sort of it can take up to three months or so to really kind of get to a steady state and, and sort of see dogs kind of fully get used to it. The phenobarbital, not usually quite that long, um, but often at least for that first you know, three or four weeks, they can certainly you know, have those features. There are some dogs that are more sensitive you know, to one or both of those medications where the side effects are, are great. And certainly the idea is to find a, find a balance, you know, both the things, you know, that are troubling you at home are affecting his quality of life. And then also the frequency and or severity of the seizures are, of course, impacting of his quality of life. And the idea is to find sort of a happy balance there. You know, neither of those are good things for him to experience. Can we try to find the sweet spot where we minimize the side effects, but don't go into a situation where he has a you know, either back-to-back -back seizures, more frequent seizures, or a seizure that doesn't stop, which might be the primary concern, you know, of his provider with the duration getting a little longer. You know, if it's a violent seizure for five or six minutes, that's going to have implications as it relates to his overall health. And could those, you know, sort of progress into, you know, an episode that doesn't stop, which is pretty uncommon, but certainly there's, there's that risk. And so it's interesting that you haven't noticed any effect, you know, of the medications overall that the pattern is, is so very fixed kind of despite what you've tried and it sounds like you've tried many things. And um, that's a little less common. Usually we're getting at least some, some benefit from our intervention. And the, the question would of course be, well, what would his frequency be without the medications or with less medications? Because assuming he's an epileptic patient, which obviously we, we haven't definitively, it sounds like proved, but the assumption, you know, Labrador starting at young adulthood, normal between seizures has a fair bit of trappings of being epileptic. Many epileptics do have a progressive course where their seizures become more frequent or more severe over time. And so the question is the fact that his seizures haven't gotten worse, is that actually the benefit of the medication? Meaning would they be more frequent w without the medications? And so Hard to know, but it is interesting that he's been kind of perfectly static, you know, as it sounds in terms of at least the frequency, maybe a little bit, you know, progression with regards to the duration or the severity, but um, it's interesting that there's been, you know, almost no effect. Um, 
if you know if we're reasonably sure that you know as we've adjusted medications that it's it's not made anything better or worse and you feel like you know the lesser of the evils if you will is is the the symptoms that you're noticing at home then certainly considering discussing a dose reduction is is reasonable just knowing though that there is the potential for the frequency to or severity to increase uh, but again it's finding that sweet spot and so if the things you're noticing are so very severe that you think that's actually affecting his quality of life more so than the seizures themselves. And um, then it might be, you know, that a dose reduction is something to consider. Um, other things that also could be considered, and again, can't give specific recommendations because we've not met him and don't know his general sort of health, but um, there are other seizure medications. And sometimes we just have to find what makes a difference for a particular patient, you know, even though these are two very good and considered to be reasonably strong seizure medications. And um, there are definitely some dogs that just respond better to one drug over another. Um, I don't know if we've tried Keppra or Levetiracetam or, or, or whatever the equivalent might be. That one tends to be a little less sedating. And um, so whether or not you know, we add that in and then reduce the dose of, of these others that are having a bit more of a side effect and see if that you know, at least keeps him where he is as opposed to you know, potentially getting worse. The other consideration would be, is there anything we can do during the seizure if it's truly a five to six minute seizure to try to get it to subside a little bit faster for him. Obviously, you know, that type of intervention won't help with controlling the frequency, but could we minimize the duration? Um, something to consider would be, and depending on, I don't know the, the laws, regulations, rules and whatnot, you know, in, in the UK, so check, check with his doctor, but um, sometimes we'll send home something that an owner can apply in the nose. Um, it's sort of an anti-seizure medication that, that's very short acting. Um, obviously, to your comfort, you know, whether if he's thrashing about, you know, obviously I don't want you to get bit or injured in trying to administer it, but if you felt you could safely administer it, and if it was within the prescribing rules, you know, in the UK, and um, whether or not applying that liquid in his nose when he starts to have the seizure might sort of reduce the severity of the episode. And that would be something that could be considered. It works maybe for about half of dogs in, in my opinion. So it's definitely not a you know, obvious solution. It's not like it's going to guarantee the episode stops. Um, but for at least half of dogs, I feel like that at home management for dogs that have really long seizures or dogs that have kind of back to back seizures, sort of coming up with a pulse therapy protocol of something we give kind of in that moment um, does seem to help at least half or so of dogs. Um, so that might be something to consider if it's not so much that we're unhappy with the frequency, but more so, you know, we want less long term meds, but we also want a shorter duration might we be able to get a shorter duration by giving sort of midazolam, you know, intranasally or, or the equivalent, um, which is sort of a, a very short acting seizure medication. It definitely will make him wobbly and act abnormally for, you know, a couple of hours after you give it, but then it wears off. So it will have no implications, you know, on, on the other days, you know, the other 29 or so days of the month, he would have, you know, no side effects from it because it's very, very short lived. Um, that would be maybe something to consider as, as well, just to try to reduce the severity because the five to six minute component, if that's truly five to six minutes of active generalized seizure activity is pretty long um, into the realm of where we start to worry about, are we gonna overheat? Could there be potential you know, damage to our organs and things like that? Um, thankfully it doesn't sound like that's happened so far, but, but that's a pretty long duration that, that does worry me a little bit, which is also probably why your doctor's being you know, conservative as it relates to being worried about adjusting the medications probably because of that duration. Brilliant. I mean, I'm lucky that he's never had clusters. Good. It's always one single sort of fairly long seizure. So, you know, uh, in, in that way, I do look at it and think, you know, at least it's not cluster seizures. Um, my vet did say if this increase wasn't suitable, he said we could gradually decrease and look at Kepra. So Kepra's not as much, the side effects of Kepra isn't as much tends to be much better tolerated for the average dog. Granted, every dog is different, but if Keppra is having a sedating effect, it's generally only for the first two weeks and then they okay. get used to it. So it's a, a shorter timeline to adapting than, than the others. Um, overall, they tend to have very minimal side effects from it, if any. Um, but the dogs that do have a little bit of wobbliness or a little bit of lethargy or sedation, it's generally reasonably subtle um, and Within two weeks, you know, probably 95% of dogs will have, have no side effects um, once okay. they've gotten used to it. So it would be a consideration to add yeah. that in 
before making the dose reduction of the others just to decrease the odds of getting into trouble. It doesn't guarantee that you'd be able to lower you know, one of the others successfully, but it would maybe give you a little bit of comfort of saying, well, they have something there to kind of fill that void um, you know, before reducing the doses on the others. And certainly looking critically at the blood levels of those other medications yeah. and making sure you know, they can both have pretty similar side effects. So you know, sort of trying to look at the timeline of when you've adjusted the doses for those and what the levels are for those to try to decide you know, which one you're going to reduce a little bit. Um, and definitely if, if you and the prescriber decide upon a dose reduction, Definitely only reduce, <laughs> hi buddy, uh, only reduce one of them at a time. Um, yeah. so if we make a, even if it's a tiny change, if we make a tiny change to both at the same time and he has more seizures or longer seizures, we won't necessarily know which one accounted for that difference. So okay. generally only changing one thing, one thing at a time. Okay. Good then. Sorry. <laughs> Never work with dogs. <laughs> okay. Now that's lovely. Thank you ever so much for your advice. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, you. Sharon. All right. Have a great night. And to you. Thank you again. I'm just going to ask you one more question, Dr. DePompa, because there are kind of two, two related questions, um, but both sort of about bladder management. A uh, dog that had seizure and the se wow, dog that had surgery and is going home tomorrow and they're worried about bladder management. And then a dog that had an ANNPE in April and is still incontinent needing to express his bladder daily. So I, I guess if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, bladder management, when we recommend it, what to be looking for, et cetera. Um, so whether it's an ANNPE versus, versus a IVDD in surgery. Sure. So kind of regardless of the cause, certain spinal cord problems can result in an in inability to empty our, our bladder kind of effectively or at all, depending on, on sort of the severity. And so, um, Certainly, some of those patients require, you know, sort of expressions and, and assistance to do that, which obviously, you know, for the dog that had surgery, presumably whoever did the surgery is, is, is going to teach you how to do that if they think that that, you know, needs to be continued for a period of time. Obviously, as both of these patients hopefully Im improve, or at least the, the surgical patient, um, as their function in their limbs is improving, the idea would be that there would be a parallel to that in, in bladder function improvement. Um, Often most dogs that are able to move their legs obviously and start walking again around that same period of time are gonna regain that ability to urinate with, with some exceptions. Um, the most important things as it relates to sort of bladder expressions for the dogs that require that, that kind of assistance is being patient with it, um, you know, not getting, getting stressed, not pressing too hard, not pressing hard enough, finding kind of that sweet spot. Keeping the dog relaxed makes it a lot easier. So if, if we're stressed about doing it and we stress the dog in doing it, they're going to tense up. It's going to be a lot harder for us to help them. So being gentle and calm in, in that approach, doing it frequent enough. Um, if we find sort of urine in, in the bedding and things like that, um, be cautious in the interpretation of that. If it's that we don't expect that we're able to urinate voluntarily, that might just be overflow, meaning if we're not expressing well enough or frequently enough, there's the potential for urine to sort of spill out and sort of quote unquote overflow. But let's not interpret that to definitively mean that, you know, oh my gosh, you know, he or she urinated, so so we don't have to do this anymore. It may very well mean that we need to do it more frequently or 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 more thoroughly. So if we find urine in the bedding, best thing to do is try to express the bladder at that time. And if you get a significant volume of urine out, um, then it means that was probably overflow as opposed to a, a proper attempt at urination. Um, the idea though would be if if it's a patient that we expect to recover in terms of walking, oftentimes that's a, a temporary sort of need. Um, other than doing it frequently, doing it effectively, doing it you know, cautiously but appropriately um, and not sort of misinterpreting finding of, of urine. Other main thing is making sure that the urine is cleaned off of their skin very frequently. So even with the, 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 the most care possible in expressing the bladder, some is gonna get you know, on their belly or kind of between their thighs and things making sure we clean that off really, really well and really frequently because the urine is relatively caustic as it relates to the skin. So they'll get rashes and things like that, just like, just like babies, presumably. So uh, make sure we keep them, you know, very clean and, and dry, you know, after expressions or after if they leak a bit on themselves um, and then hopefully improve if it's a patient that, that you know, has the potential to improve. Great. Well, 
I think this was very useful. I, I, I hope everyone got some value out of it. Do you have any closing thoughts or anything to add? No, I don't think so. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm sure that uh, we're everything's busy out there outside of our offices right now. So thanks for your time today. And uh, again, if you've got questions in, in the future, put them in the comments and Emily will try and get you on our, our uh, Q&A for next week or email them to Q&A at sevneurology.com. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.